Hey y'all! Welcome to part 2 of the Neural Networks in a Spreadsheet series. In the previous video, we made and trained a single layer neural network. In this video, we will explore deep neural networks, starting with the benefits the additional layers bring us. We'll implement and train a deep neural network using the same process as before, but with just a few small changes to the formula components. The function we had our neural network learn last time was the AND function. This time we'll learn the exclusive OR function, also called the XOR or ZOR function. The XOR function is true when exactly one of the inputs is true, as outlined below. Here we are in the train XOR template, and it says to make a copy of the train AND sheet, so let's go ahead and do that. Because we should be able to reuse the same process as before. So train XOR, just we want to learn a different function. So I'm going to copy and paste the XOR function outlined here. See our desired outputs have changed, and the cost functions changed, activation charts a little different. Great, so let's scroll down and see what's what. We would expect the cost to continue to get lower and lower, and we would expect this gradient to get to a solution. Oh, it's really weird. Looks like our cost is still around one, even though we've gone the same 20 steps as the AND function. Well, maybe we got a little unlucky. Let's go ahead and try a different set of inputs. Let's say 0, minus 2, 0. Is that good? Yeah, sure. So we start off with a cost of 1.2. We see it twist a little bit. Gradient, well, now it's kind of stagnated. It's all the same activation. That's, and that's really strange. The cost is staying at 1. And the amounts that are being changed are very, very little. That's weird. It appears that our simple neural network is not learning the function. I wonder why. Our single layer neural network worked fine last time to learn the AND function. I want to draw your attention to this line on our plane when the activation is 0.5. This is the halfway up the hill part of our curve. If we plot that line in 2D, we see that line neatly separates zeros from our 1. We say that the AND function is linearly separable because we are able to draw such a line. However, in our ZOR function, we cannot do that. No matter which straight line we draw, we can't separate the zeros from the ones. If we look at the points in 3D, we can see why. We would need a curve like this with two halfway up the hill lines to separate our zeros from our ones. Because we need more than one straight line to separate them, we say that the ZOR function is not linearly separable. Functions which are not linearly separable end up being a problem for single layer neural networks. Because the activation is based on a linear function of inputs, such a network can never accurately learn functions which are not linearly separable. This is where deep neural networks shine. By adding one or more extra layers, also known as hidden layers, our network will be able to handle more complex functions, where the solution plane bends and twists more. Let's build a deep neural network with this structure. It has one hidden layer with two nodes. Keep an eye on the behavior of each of the hidden nodes. Despite both being connected to both inputs, we'll see that they behave very differently and work together to get the desired output behavior. Here we are in the interactive deep XOR sheet. I've gone ahead and put in some biases and weights that will be illustrative later. To fill out our inputs, I'm going to copy and paste our work from the train XOR sheet. It should be the same using absolute references there. Now for our first weighted sum, first biased plus first weight times first input plus the second weight times the second input. And I'm going to copy that formula down, changing the J and K to 15 to 16 and to 17. Again, our second of three weighted sums. I'm going to have bias two now plus weight three times input one plus weight four times input two. Same copy and paste deal, except now we're K, again, K to 15, J to 15, 16, 16, and 17. 17. Our first hidden layer, so the activation of hidden 3 is going to be, again, the logistic 
of the weighted sum Z3. So let's copy the logistic formula from our little cheat sheet spot there. And for cell, I want to target column L, so L14. And autofill, yes, that's what we want. For the activation of hidden four, it's going to be this almost the same thing, except targeting the M row. So I'll just drag that over. Now our final weighted sum of this deep neural net, we're going to have bias three plus the weight five. And instead of being multiplied by any of the inputs, it's going to use activation three and four as its inputs. So we'll multiply by A3 and add on weight six times A4. I'm going to copy and paste this, updating O and N to be row 15, row 16, and finally 17. We've got one more logistic function to use. I'll just copy and save myself a little bit of typing. Instead of targeting L, we want to target P. All right, we'll just drag that down. Now our cost function, again, is going to be the same as when we were in our train XOR. So I'm going to just go over there, copy and paste that, and go ahead and get the sum. There you go, 1.117. Not great, but not terrible. I'm going to go ahead and unhide our activation chart so we can take a look at that now that we've got our cells working. Notice here that we've got the hidden three and hidden four with vertical stripes and horizontal stripes. And then how our output layer depends on both of those, you can kind of see how they join together to get a function that is up and to the right. This should look very familiar activation wise because this was close-ish to the solution of our AND function. And the reason it uses both hidden nodes equally is because I have the weights the same. But if I were to change weight five to zero, well, what that would do is that would make output five only dependent on hidden layer four. So we would expect any amount of the vertical striping to go away. So let's try that out. Sure enough, we're now left with just some horizontal stripes and they're a different color, different activation level because uh, hidden layer four is only outputting fairly low values. It's not outputting ones or zeros. It's something a little bit less or something a little bit more. So it's a little bit more of a gradient there. I haven't shown you anything new. These still look like linear functions, but let's go ahead and add in an example that demonstrates that. Minus two, eight, zero, six, negative eight, zero, negative five, four, four. So let's start looking at how the output five depends on the hidden layers. There's a bias and then both weights are the same. So it's going to depend on both nodes equally. And I just have that here for illustrative purposes. When we train the layer, it's make it different than that. But notice now how I've got the gradient going from low to high as, we, as the X value increases and high to low in the other hidden node as X increases and how the combined output, output five, goes from low to high and then kind of turns around and goes back down. If you're familiar with linear equations, you'll notice that that's not linear. Linear equations can only go up or they can only go down. And here's a demonstration of how it goes up and then back down. This may not seem like it's close to our solution. In fact, our cost is nowhere near where we'd like, but let's imagine what the real solution should be. We want darker values in the upper left and in the lower right, and then white values in the lower left and upper right. So if you can maybe imagine, we want this shape to kind of to tilt a bit. So go ahead and pause the video, try playing with the weights I have, and see if you can get it to tilt. Hopefully you've given it a shot. Let's go ahead and type in some values I found that work pretty well to show this. So six, negative four, negative four. And negative three, six, six, negative six, four, four. And boom, there we go. Cost 0.138, that's pretty good. 
And this matches sort of what we pictured the solution to be. Here we go, having a deep neural net that has managed to learn a nonlinear function. In Sheets, it might have been hard to picture that nonlinear equation since we only had a 2D plot. So here we are in GeoGebra, link in the description if you want to follow along, where we can look at it in three dimensions. I have our two outputs that are zero down here, A and D, and then our two outputs that are one, here C and B. Let's look at the activation of the first hidden layer. And we see that it's able to curve up. So it starts low, and that's able to get close to point D, curve up and hit B and C. Now, if we were to look at the cost function, A is way off. So this by itself isn't a good solution. But if we go ahead and look at the second hidden, node, we see that it comes from the other way. So it starts low, curves up, and then gets close to B and C. And then this is where if we look at both of them. We can kind of see that we kind of want a blend of them in order to get a good result. And in fact, this is exactly what the final output that depends on both the hidden inputs looks like. So let's clear up those two. And we can see how our solution curves up and then back down. Especially as we get to more and more nodes, training a neural net by hand does not sound fun. Here are the formulas we use to train the single layer neural network. Fortunately, most of these are the same for deep networks too. How much the cost depends on the activation of the output stays the same, but I'll add this O subscript to indicate I'm talking about an output node. Like before, we cannot directly compute how much the cost depends on the activation of the hidden layer, but we can use the chain rule instead. We'll multiply these two quantities that we've seen before by this new quantity, how much the weighted sum of the hidden layer depends on the activation of the hidden layer. And this fortunately works out to be just the weight that's connecting the hidden node to the output node. I realize this is an alarming amount of symbols on the page, but let's jump into the spreadsheet where we can see a concrete example. Let's start with the neural network itself. We can go ahead and copy our existing neural network computation because that's all the same mathematics. One thing I want to double check is that we've got absolute references for both the input column and the cost computation column. And let's start with the right and work our way left. So we want to train or com compute how much we need to shift this final output node. And these quantities are ba basically the same. In fact, let's go ahead and directly copy those cells that are computing how much the cost depends on the activation and how much the activation depends on the weighted sum, because those formulas have not changed at all. We're simply taking the answer we got, subtracting off the answer we expected, multiplying by two, that amount of error term. How much the weighted sum of this final layer depends on its bias? Well, that's still one because of this formula right here. And then how much the weighted sum depends on weight five and six? Our formula says that's the input to that cell. The only difference there is that output five is now being fed from the hidden node three and four. So we'll be using those values instead. So I want to connect this cell to the activation of three. And weight six is dependent on activation four. So that we can just copy those down. So now we've got how much the cost depends on bias three, five, and six. And again, this is very, this is the exact same because we're just multiplying the three terms together. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy all of those cells from our single layer node. And you'll see that those are just multiplying together how much the cost depends on the activation, how much the activation depends on the weighted sum, and then by either one of these three cells here. And then we go ahead and average those together to get how much all of them, all of the training inputs vote on how to change the biases and the weights. Boom, we're done. We're done with the output layer. Now let's go for the first layer of nodes, the hidden nodes. So we have to compute this new value, how much the weighted sum of the fifth node depends on the activation of three and four. 
And as I've mentioned in the little formula notes here, that's just going to be the weight between the hidden layer and the outputs. For A3, it's going to be weight 5, so H14. For how much 5 depends on the activation of 4, that's going to be weight 6. I'm going to go ahead and copy these down using uh, copy and paste because we want them to all refer to the same cell. All right, and then for I14, we've got one more new quantity to compute, how much the cost depends on the activation of a hidden layer, so A3. And this says we're going to multiply the two terms we've already computed times that new term. So multiply how much the cost depends on the activation of 5, how much the activation of 5 depends on the weighted sum of 5. Again, 5 because that's our output node. And then multiply that by how much the activation of 5 depends on the, how much the weighted sum of 5 rather depends on the activation of 3. One more time for how much the cost depends on the activation of 4. I'm going to multiply the same two terms. And then multiply that by how much the weighted sum of 5 depends on the activation of 4. And we get to just copy those down for the other training inputs. Now we are in the clear. We're back to familiar territory from our single layer neural network. So how much the activation depends on the weighted sum for 3 is the derivative of our logistic function. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that sigmoid prime equation here. And the input that we're going to have for this is the weighted sum. So that's all the way over here. L14. That's going to be the cell that we want to take the this exponential equation about L14, L14. Because this cell is right next to M14, we can just go ahead and copy that over and then copy both of those cells down. So these cells are all dealing with these weighted sums here. How much the weighted sum of the nodes depends on the biases? That's always the constant one. So we can just copy those in. And then how much, how much the hidden node depends on the weight is the input itself. So we're going to copy the inputs here. We should see after we fill this out that this is our the inputs to our samples. So 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and 1, 1. And we like that so much. We're going to do it one more time for our other hidden node. I keep saying final step. I guess I'm just getting excited here. Now we want to compute our final amount of how much the cost depends on each of the biases and the weights. And as we've seen before, we're going to multiply three quantities together. So how much the cost depends on the activation of our hidden node 3 times how much that activation of 3 depends on its weighted sum times how much the weighted sum depends on the bias. We're going to do that same thing. So the first two quantities we multiply stays the same. Now we multiply by the weight column one more time. Again, the same first two multiplication steps. Multiply then by the weight 2 column. Uh, not a lot going on from that first sample set, but that's OK. Now for B2, we're now considering, because uh, bias 2 feeds into the hidden node 4, we're going to how much, see how much the cost depends on the activation of the fourth node, times how much the activation of the fourth node depends on its weighted sum, times how much the weighted sum depends on the bias, and the same thing, but with the weight 3 column, and one final computation here. Same first two multiplications and then now the weight 4. Then we can drag these all down, fill them out for the other samples, and just like we did before we can take the average of all of our twists and turns from the various training inputs. 
so that we've got kind of a unified opinion on how much each of the weights and biases should shift. So we've computed these quantities here. Now to apply them to the bias and weights to do our actual training step, we come down here. We're just going to start with bias three because that's a little more convenient. So we want to take the original bias three, subtract off how much we want to change the bias times our learning rate. And I'm going to use absolute reference here. So F4 or possibly Alt F4 if you're on a Mac. And then copy that over to pick up weights five and six. So we see that there have been small tweaks to these three values. That's good. That's good. We would expect small steps. Now we got to do this one more time for the remaining bias and weights. So we take the bias we had before and bias one. We subtract off how much the cost depends on bias one, multiply by the learning rate. And again, I'm going to use absolute references here. And slide that all the way across. We can see from the activation note that maybe there's a small shift in this upper right hand corner. So our algorithm hasn't made too drastic of a change for this first step. I'm going to copy all of our computation cells here and paste them down so we can make another step happen. If you've done everything right, you should see a cost of 1.914 for step one. So we'll check to make sure your math works out. And you see that they have made more opinions on how to change the biases and the weights. So now I'm going to copy this whole set of cells and start pasting it down. And as I'm doing that, I'm watching the activation note chart to see how it starts to train a solution. And already by step six, we see our cost function is dropping. And it almost looks like a cold front is coming in from the north if I'm looking at this activation chart. See, it's starting to fill down. And that's, that's kind of what we want, given what we saw in our manual training. Keep, keep going. The cold front is getting much darker now and is starting to spread towards the bottom right, which is good because we want the bottom right to become that dark blue. We want it to be close to a 1 in its activation. Now just uh, all right, 20, finally at 20 steps, our cost has gotten down all the way to 0.175. We can see for the four inputs we've given it, sure enough, the inside two values are decently close to one. They're at least above half. And then our other values, which we would expect to be zero, are decently close to zero. They're at least under half. One final thing I want to point out is how these activation charts compare between the solution we hand trained and the one our algorithm found. Let's go take a look at that. Notice how the, the final node is pretty close to the same shape. And I bet if we let this go, it would get even closer to that. But the hidden nodes are kind of inverse. See how they go dark in 0, 0 and light in 1, 1 on this one and kind of the inverse below. But over here, we start in the light and get towards the dark. This illustrates, to me at least, how there isn't only one correct solution for, finding, for training a neural network. But there's, in fact, multiple. And the training algorithm, fortunately, only needs to find one of them. Let's recap. We built and trained a deep neural network to learn the exclusive OR function. And the reason we needed a deep neural network was because our single layer network could only learn functions that were linearly separable. I've included a bonus sheet that shows how the formula changes slightly when you have multiple output nodes. The function demonstrated there is a one bit half adder, which is effectively the combination of an AND function and the exclusive OR function. I hope this series has made the inner workings of a neural net more tangible and the components of the backpropagation algorithm more apparent. With these concrete examples in hand, you should be prepared to dive deeper into the theory of neural nets, explore more advanced neural network patterns, or even try making your own. Happy learning.